Illusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer and the doors of perception. The good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exotic. The myths, the truths. Toxicology. Astro seismology. Magnetism. The dark side. Genetically engineered potatoes. Planetoid. Planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> This show was first broadcast in June 2008. Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Relax while we fry your brain with weird and wonderful science. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, we'll feature Fanny McClay, flying saucers and mining companies take the piss. But first up, here's the news with Patrick Ruby. <laughs> Flying saucers are for real, in an article on physorg.com. Professor Sabrata Roy of the University of Florida has filed a patent for a new circular spinning aircraft. The aircraft is called a wingless electromagnetic air vehicle, or WEAVE for short. This prototype would be less than six inches long and powered by onboard batteries. It will work by utilizing magnetohydrodynamics. An electrical current is passed through ionized air or plasma. This then pushes against the surrounding air to create lift and momentum while stabilizing the aircraft against gusts of wind. The new aircraft would contain no moving parts and would be able to hover and take off and land from a vertical position. The US Air Force and NASA are interested in the new design. If cameras are fitted, it could be used in surveillance and navigation, all while being controlled via remote control. But some limitations of the design need to be addressed first. More thrust is needed to be generated to counter the drag forces and gravity if it is to fly successfully on Earth. The power supply needs to remain very lightweight if it is to fly, and it is possible the plasma generated for lift will interfere with the aircraft's communication system. If successful, however, eventually large models might be designed for space exploration and investigations of other moons and planets. And now for more scientific gadgets in NewScientist.com. New technologies to control our bodies. Wireless antennas hidden within our clothing might someday broadcast signals around our bodies to connect up and control medical devices and implants, such as pacemakers. This improved communication could double the battery life of medical devices and make them function more efficiently. The wireless antenna design was conceived by William Scanlon and Gareth Conway from Queen's University Belfast in Northern Ireland. The antenna uses a creeping wave effect to channel signals sideways in a similar way to how sound is directed to a person's ear at the side of their head. It is made of an inverted monopole, which means there is a plate placed on top of the antenna, which channels the signal along the skin towards other devices instead of away from the body. From skin-long signals to stinky smells, dingo urine could be used in future as a pest control in an article printed on ABC Online. Sprays and gels derived from the urine might keep marsupials such as kangaroos out of gardens and reforestation zones where they can cause damage to the environment. Dr Michael Parsons and colleagues from Curtin University Australia have been testing this hypothesis. They've been studying the effects of dingo urine on marsupial populations in field studies in Western Australia and Tasmania for the last two years. In a recent three-day study at a feeding station in Tasmania, they found on average 28 wallabies and 47 possums visited the station each night if no dingo urine was sprayed. After spraying, the number of visitors was reduced to six wallabies and nine possums per night on average. Gas chromatography mass spectroscopy has identified 200 chemicals in dingo urine. These are pheromone-like chemicals which are detected by the vomeronasal organ in the noses of marsupials. Using technology developed by the perfume industry, scientists might be able to make the pheromone synthetically and produce it as cheaply as possible. The repellent smell would allow loggers, farmers and gardeners to rely less on shooting and poison baiting to control the marsupials in the special reforestation zones on mine site.
Thank you, Patrick. Lachlan Watmore is here to tell us the story of a 19th century pioneer naturalist, Fanny Maclay. When people think of early pioneers in Australia, they invariably think of Burke and Wills, Sturt, Leichhardt, Bass and Flinders, men who went out and explored things. They don't think about women. And I'd like to address this by talking about one of my heroines, Fanny Maclay, a naturalist, meticulous collector of specimens, brilliant scientific artist, and a woman definitely ahead of her time. Frances Leonora Maclay was the eldest daughter of Alexander and Eliza Maclay and arrived in the young colony of New South Wales in 1826. Alexander had been made colonial secretary of the colony and had brought his wife and family with him. He was also an avid naturalist with a passion for botany, entomology and zoology and shared this passion with his eldest son and daughter. Along with his family, he also brought the bulk of his private entomological or insect collection, which was one of the finest in Europe. He had every intention of enlarging it with the wondrous new animals of New South Wales and because his duties as colonial secretary kept him working up to 12 hours a day, he turned to Fanny for help. In the early 19th century, natural history, which today encompasses zoology, botany, ecology and geology, was a young discipline, the domain of mainly men with too much time on their hands. A woman was usually discouraged from any type of education except what was required to run a household, a little bit of botany for the garden, a little bit of medicine for the children. My admiration for Fanny is based on the fact that she completely rejected such sentiments and before she left England had already educated herself in natural history to which she added astronomy and landscape gardening. And once in Sydney she didn't hesitate to get out in the bush and start collecting, ignoring the murmurs of her detractors that such behaviour was unladylike. Throughout history art has frequently been in the service of religion. In Australian history, art is more commonly linked with science. It all started when Joseph Banks brought Dr Solander, a botanical artist, with him on the endeavour. And after the settling of New South Wales, natural history artists would make pilgrimages to excuse me, pilgrimages to the new colony to find a new specimen and paint it. And if you want an idea of Fanny Maclay's amazing scientific ability as a scientific artist, go to Elizabeth Bay House, which Alexander built. Walk up the steps, go in the front door, turn left, and you'll see what I mean. There hangs a copy of an incredible painting. It's a simple flower arrangement of European, Australian and South African flowers reminiscent of a still life. But what's extraordinary is the detail and the vividness of the colours, the veins in the leaves, the texture of the petals, even the brilliance of a male willy wagtail she's included. The style is very much like Salvador Dali without the dripping clock. And in my humble opinion, looking at this painting alone justifies a trip to Elizabeth Bay House. Few of Fanny's other works have survived, only a few paintings and a handful of pencil drawings still exist. Most appear to have been lost in transit back to England because she sent many illustrations to naturalists at the British Museum and the Royal Society. Fanny didn't marry until she was 43. She'd always felt that marriage was overrated and once confided to her brother William, I shall never marry. I always said so. This may look like sour grapes, and in some degree I have no doubt correctly so, for I have never yet met with a person I could have taken for better or worse. However, in June 1836, she married the Assistant Colonial Secretary, Thomas Harrington. Perhaps she should have stayed a spinster, because six weeks later, she was dead. She had had a weak heart, and it suddenly killed her when she got a cold and a stomach complaint at the same time. Her family and many in the colony were desolate, for she was much loved and respected not only for scientific achievements, but also civic duty. However, before I sign off, I'd better acknowledge Elizabeth Winshuttle's excellent little booklet, Taste and Science, The Maclay Women. Pick yourself up a copy at Elizabeth Bay House when you visit Fanny's painting. As I said, it's worth the trip. That was Lachlan Watmore with one of Australia's few 19th century women scientists, Fanny Maclay. You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. So, Patrick, in the news, why is it you think that miners need reforestation? Like, what's mining got to do with forestation and marsupials? This was something that I was thinking about, Ian. I wasn't entirely sure, but it could possibly be that once a mining site has been been used once they're finished with it they have an obligation to fill in the hole and actually reforest the area to try and regenerate the surrounding environment and it's possible that the kangaroos or the wallabies might be interfering with this reforestation period i would have thought it was a good thing if the wildlife wants to go back but maybe it's too fragile at an early stage 
And flying saucers, that was really interesting. So the flying saucers are using magnetohydrodynamics, is that right? Yes, that's right. They're actually ionizing the air and they're using the turbulence generated from that ionization to create lift, which is pretty cool. I have to say I've watched a couple of flying saucer movies in my youth when I was a young, tender, impressionable man. How big are these flying saucers? Uh, They're not that big. They're a bit less than six inches, the ones that they've been, well, the prototype design, because they they need to be fairly lightweight. The, The trouble is the weight of the battery that they need to carry with them to generate the current, which is going to I was just about to mention that because, you see, Mythbusters did an episode where they investigated anti-gravity devices sold on the internet, Mm -hmm. and the only device that worked was using ionized air for lift. Uh And it was very high voltage, though, very high current. So it sounds to me like this is the same effect, only more intelligently applied. (laughs) To a flying saucer. To a flying saucer. Definitely. All the kids will want one. I know. I mean, it would be great. And, you know, NASA and the US Air Force are interested in it, which is always a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> it just seems to me... For surveillance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Right. Moving on. Moving on. You know, Groucho Marx once said, you're only as young as the woman you feel. And He was a wise man, wasn't he, He Groucho was a wise Marx? man. And it turned out that, well... The latest research seems to be that this applies to flies. That Uh older flies living with younger flies not only live longer and seem more resistant to stress, but you can not only see how long they live, but you can look in the way their genes are expressing proteins and it changes when they live with the younger flies. So if you've got a, say, if you're an older female fly and you've got yourself a toy boy... It actually changes your DNA. It changes, it changes the way the your way genes it, are expressed. That's right. You're wearing, you're wearing younger genes. <laughs> you're wearing much younger genes. And does this apply outside of flies? Well, yes, it does. They've done more research with mice, and uh-huh. mice show the same effect. So the mice with the toy boys live longer and are more resistant to stress. And again, their genes are expressing the proteins of a younger mouse rather than of an older mouse, so that they're young on the inside as well as on the outside. Well, that's fascinating. I think for for a mouse, it might make a slightly more significant difference because don't flies only live for a couple of weeks anyway? That's right. For a week or so. So if you're an old fly, if you're two weeks old and you hang out with a, with a day-old fly, you <laughs> might live for another day or so. Well, you know, every second counts. Oh, well, when you're a fly, it definitely does. I can, I can imagine. And, of course, this is leading on to the fact that the reason they're originally doing research on flies and mice is because they don't live very long. You can do lots of experiments on longevity in the lab. Mm-hmm. And all of the research has been focused on the lab, and they finally realised that some animals in the wild, contrary to orthodox belief, actually do live to an old age. Some of them do survive to an old age. Without getting eaten Without getting or, eaten hunted, or hunted or, or, or fought with or, or anything, which means that we actually need to see how natural ageing occurs and how these animals live a long time. And maybe we can apply some of that to humans as well. Yeah, that would be an interesting idea. See, um, see how these animals live in the wild. They obviously wouldn't be living in any places where any of that urine, dingo urine, is sprayed, I think. <laughs> Did I mention that the dingo urine story also reminded me of some research on wolves where they showed in Europe that wolves sniff the trees for urine as well. And so if humans urinate on the trees, the wolves stay away. Now, I don't know whether this means that if humans have been doing this for the last couple of thousand years, they didn't need to be afraid of wolves in Europe and hunt them almost to extinction. Or if the wolves are afraid of human smell because we almost hunted them to extinction. So what you're saying is we humans are to wolves what the dingoes are to kangaroos in Australia. <laughs> exactly. They just don't like the way our urine smells. They you know, stay they, away. They smell us, they better stay away. Yeah, well, it's coming a bit too late for the wolves in England now, I think. And of course, flying saucers have an, you know, a long history in the movies and in popular culture ever since... Somebody whose name completely escapes me once described to the US Air Force that he saw these unidentified flying objects in the shape 
of flying saucers. And there are lots of attempts to build flying saucers. Like there are apparently unclassified documents about you know, a flying wing that the military tried and, and various attempts at building hovercraft and other things that in a flying saucer disc shape. And most of them, well, they might be good for reconnaissance and you know secret spying stuff, but most of them weren't any use for regular um, sort of commercial air traffic or for space. I can't imagine there would be. Well, sounds, maybe the new one. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. It sounds it sounds a lot also. like an episode of The X-Files, to be honest. <laughs> Thinking about these sightings of flying saucers and military conspiracies and stuff. Well, the fun thing about the magnetohydrodynamic flying saucers that you were talking about is that because they're using ionised air, if you were near them, your hair would actually stand up on end and you would feel like something strange was going on. And would your skin get all goosebumpy? It would all, all your little prickly. hairs would stand up because of the electric field so from the ionised gas. And that if you could be the it, answer, couldn't it? It could be, and if you touched it, you might get a shock. Oh, my goodness. So maybe somebody else has already built these and used them. Ah. We don't know. New Scientist, in its gizmo section, has about the invention of a portable hug. A portable hug. A portable hug. How would you like to have a portable hug on demand? You press a button and you get hugged. How good is that? I would love that, Ian. In fact, I could do with a portable hug right now. (laughs) Well, Brian Mullen at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst has invented an inflatable vest that fits inside the lining of a jacket and delivers a portable hug to children with autism. Wow. Apparently, deep pressure touch stimulation, or a hug, in normal talk, yeah. seems to ease children's anxiety if they're suffering from autism. And in adults with autism as well, a strong pressure, a hug, seems Helps to it. seems to calm them down. Okay. I thought for some people that suffered from autism, physical contact was something they wanted to avoid. Well, it all depends on the context. It, like, it's a little complex. I remember reading about adult woman with autism who invented a device that was derived from a cattle press that sort of put two bumpers in front and behind her to put pressure on her and that felt comforting so she could concentrate on on her work. This sounds like a much more sophisticated version that doesn't show to the outside world. So instead of having to get into a device that puts pressure on you to make you feel better, you can just press a button and have the pressure where nobody can see inside your jacket and so you don't look any different. Except for the smile on your face. Except for the smile on your face. (laughs) Confidentially, I think the idea indubitably has questionable sociological ramifications. Can dolphins talk? Talking is one of those things we have long seen as an ability that separates us from other animals. Of course, the problem is the closer we looked, the more we found that some animals do use language. Chickens clearly use different sounds, or words, to warn of different kinds of predators, as do monkeys. So we changed our definitions of language to keep ahead of these observations. Preserving our uniqueness. The new definition of language included word, order, grammar. Now we've had little success in translating dolphin sound patterns into meaning, beyond their individual names. Every dolphin has a self-identifying signature whistle. They can't speak with artificial gestural or keyboard-based languages developed for apes because of their lack of hands. Dolphin-sized keyboards only allow for simple word responses. And of course, simple words don't have grammar. So we're left with communicating to them with requests for complex actions using an artificial sound or visual language with an order-based grammar. It's easier to examine the dolphin's ability to understand language than their ability to speak language intelligibly. Louis M. Herman and his colleagues at the Kualo Basin Marine Mammal Laboratory, University of Hawaii at Manoa, have taught artificial languages to four dolphins caught from the wild. One language consists of computer-generated high-pitched words. In the second, a trainer conveys words with hand and arm gestures. Neither language bears any resemblance to human language except that both contain grammatical rules. Each language comprises of about 40 words, nouns such as channel, gate, person, and ball, verbs such as go under and fetch, and modifiers 
such as surface, bottom, right and left. The gestural language learned by the dolphins included a reverse grammar to prevent word-by-word responses. The dolphin receiving a gestural command must understand the full two or three word sentence before beginning to respond. The request, Arche under Phoenix, means the trainer would like the dolphin Arche to swim under the dolphin Phoenix. The sentence would mean the opposite if the word order changed. The dolphins learn not only what the words mean, but how to understand what the word order meant. More complex sentences were also successful. Right hoop, left frisbee, fetch, versus left hoop, right frisbee, fetch. The first sentence means take the frisbee on your left to the hoop on your right. You get the idea. The dolphins were able to understand both the semantic word meaning and the syntax, the sentence pattern meaning. When the dolphins were asked to do impossible things, the situation grew interesting. Asked to swim through a hoop that is lying flat on the bottom of the pool, the dolphin lifted the hoop up so they could swim through it. Asked some nonsense like human water fetch, or fetch the water to the human, the dolphin ignored it. Add too many nouns and you get person water hoop fetch, and the dolphin makes the best sense of it and fetches the hoop for the human. To see how abstract the communication could become, they show the dolphins a videotape of the trainer communicating with gestures. Remember that eyesight is not the dolphin's main sense. The videotape was as well understood as the live trainer. Then they blanked out the head and body of the trainer on the tape, leaving just the arms visible. The dolphins understood. Then they finally replaced the arms with two spots of light representing the positions of the trainer's hands as they gestured. The dolphins didn't perform well, but they did better than chance. College students with four months of experience with gestural language did just as well as the dolphins. From these and other studies, Herman concludes that dolphins use words of the artificial language to refer to objects in an abstract way, and that they can make sense of the grammar as well. For an entertaining and informative look at animal behaviours that show intelligence, self-awareness, and an ability to communicate, I highly recommend Eugene Linden's The Octopus and the Orangutan. In the book, Octopus Escape Artists Outsmart Humans, and chimps use sign language to insult people they don't like. It's full of wonderful stories from researchers in the field. Can dolphins talk? Well, they can certainly understand humans talking, even using complex word order grammar. And they can reply in the sound-based artificial language. Do they use real grammatical language with each other? The jury is still out on that one. The Dolphins from The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And that's all from us in this edition of Diffusion. We get very lonely here. So we'd really, really appreciate if you'd send us some emails telling us what you think, what you'd like us to talk about, and if we've stimulated any ideas that you'd like to discuss. So send us an email to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolf. Contributing to the program were Patrick Ruby and Lachlan Watmore. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod of Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including Radio Blue Mountains 89.1 FM in New South Wales, 8 Triple C in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2 NVR in Nambucca Valley, 3 MBR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7 LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, and 2 XFM in Canberra. Diffusion is narrowcast on Indigo FM 88 in northeast Victoria. Diffusion is syndicated globally on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to the podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com. And check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than a thousand previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com, where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf or join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion 
Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.